So who talks first? I talk first, you talk first. I, I think you talk first this week. Okay, that's good, because I did. Wow, we're on top of it today. Are we, though? Our show notes look like we barely have anything to talk about. Yeah, well, you know, it's the beautiful weather. Nobody wants to be sitting inside doing video games and stuff. Maybe for you, yesterday, we got one perfect day of spring. It was like that. It was like a day of California weather. Wonderful, perfect temper, you know, no need for a coat, just short sleeves, sunny, comfortable, not too hot, not too cold. And tomorrow it's going to be near, it's going to be very close to snowing. <laughs> Sleet again, huh? So annoying. I don't know if we'll get precipitation, but it's going to get down there near freezing. Wow. Well, it's been really hot here. We all this week it's been like above 80, highs above 80, so we're we're all hiding inside from the the devilish sun. For those of you who use the other temperature scale, that's about 26 degrees. Mm. Yeah. Sounds very cold to me, but apparently that's too warm yeah it's it's been nice i mean kind of when it's cold you can always put on more clothes and just like bundle up and you're fine when it's hot though it's like what are you gonna do drink more water i guess right or turn up the air conditioning but i feel guilt using air conditioning in in the spring even when the temperature justifies it like yeah it's it's 85 degrees in here, but it's May, so it feels wrong to air condition the house. Right. It's same thing with in the fall and heating. It's like, I don't want to turn on the heater. It's only, like, early October. Right. <laughs> Even though it's quite cold. Yeah. It is funny how, it, how that matters for some reason. Oh, well. Enough about the weather. Tell me about your video gaming this week. Video gaming. Uh... I played Receiver 2. Um, I kind of, I was thinking about it and I watched a, a couple uh, streamers playing it and I was like, man, I, this game seems like it's easier than, than these guys are making it out to be. Okay. That's not something I expected anyone to say about Receiver 2. Well, I don't know. It, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, it can't be that hard. Like, come on, give me a crack at it. And uh, and so I did. I, I bought a copy and, and played the game and it's... It's pretty good. It requires a lot of... I think I think it may be easier for me than it is for a lot of other people because I don't play first-person shooters a lot, so I don't have any instincts just like tap reload or, you know, tap a button to pull out my gun or whatever. Right, right. And uh, so I'm I'm just learning, like, just receiver to etiquette and, and key combos and stuff. And so it, it, I didn't have to overcome any, any ingrained habits. Interesting. It makes it easier to play if you don't have decades of first-person shooter experience. That's interesting. The main thing is that you have to be really conscientious about reloading because it takes a long time because you got to you know do all these different operations and it's slightly different for slightly different types of guns and stuff. And you have to be really careful about holstering and unholstering because if there's a round in the chamber and you just tap the button you will shoot yourself in the leg. I, I feel like maybe that's a bit too much. Like, that's the de developer going out of their way to make it more difficult than it is in real life. In real, in real life, I expect I would have trouble doing all those actions to load a gun. It fe that feels simulationist. All right. Oh, wait. I got... Why won't it go? Oh, I need to press this release. Okay. Now... Oh. I'm going to rack the slide, but why won't it move? Oh, this other, you know, that would be my experience reloading a gun. But I think anybody that's able to move and pick up simple household objects would be able to draw a, a firearm without blowing their foot off. Like, that's, like, it's made something that's easy into making it hard for the sake of making it hard. And I haven't played it myself, but that bothers me. Well, it is, uh, it's true. It is, uh, it is unusually difficult. It is justified in the setting, uh, saying that you're, it's this weird, it's this weird, like, handgun purgatory that you're in, and there's the, the threat <laughs> that's 
lurking right. and creating turrets for you to fight. And one of the things the threat does is increase the, the probability that a gun will jam or misfire or not work properly. And it also increases the likelihood that you will shoot yourself in the leg when you draw quickly. And the, the idea is that when you tap the button, you're doing it in a hurry and kind of fumbling, you know, grabbing for it really quickly. It's not like it's not like you're accidentally shooting yourself when you're just casually drawing the gun, because if you hold down the button, that's the carefully draw the gun button. And it, you never shoot yourself that yeah. way. Um, but the idea is that if you tap it, you're in a hurry, you're not thinking properly, you're not doing it the right way, which is holding it down in this case, in an interface way. And, and that means that you're grabbing and trying to, you know, you got your finger on the trigger and you're trying to get it out of the holster. And you know, of course, like that's how you shoot yourself is by putting your hand, your finger on the trigger when you're drawing the gun, like you're not supposed to do that. But if in the heat of the moment, you might like, oh, I want to shoot something. I got to put my finger on the trigger and, and you know, bad things happen. So, I don't know, it it justifies a lot of things. The same thing with, with misfires and stuff. Like, the guns are stupendously unreliable compared to real life. But that's part of the setting is like, oh, well, it degrades the, the operation of firearms and you have to be really careful because it's trying to kill you and so it's trying to make your firearms not work. <laughs> a world a loaded with firearms where firearms are all cursed. I... We're up against drones. Isn't there anything we can do about <laughs> just throw nets at them? I mean, drones are a lot easier to damage than guns. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not like the drones are, are on the side of the enemy. So it happens with ricochets, too. Like when you're shooting at the, the things, if it's not a square hit, often or almost always the bullet will ricochet off instead of penetrating. And it, that's the same thing. It's like, well, you know, the probability of that happening in real life is pretty low, but in this setting, you know, the threat is trying to protect the turrets and, and kill you, and so it makes your bullets ricochet. So what do you do if you've got two, like, you've got a lot of bullets, but you've only got two left in the mag, and do you reload, throw those two on the floor, then after you're done reloading, pick them up and put them back in your inventory? You can, uh, you can remove them from the mag, so you can, you can drop the mag and, well, I mean, you can, if you've got a magazine, you can just drop the mag and add bullets to the mag and put it back in, like, and those two bullets just stay in the magazine. Okay, okay. When you, when you drop the magazine, you don't drop it on the floor unless you want to. Uh, you, you remove it and you've got it in your other hand, but then you've got to put your gun away because you can't, you can't put bullets in the magazine with a gun in your hand. And so it's one of these things where if you've got two magazines, then you can load one up beforehand and then one's in your mag in, in the magazine. And when you drop the mag out, you can swap the magazines and now you've got a loaded one. You can load it in your gun without putting your gun away. So it's a lot faster that way. Yeah, that's cool. So have you been having a good time with it? I enjoy the the moment to moment gameplay. Uh, the main thing that is is irritating is the demotion system where there are five ranks and the game gets harder and harder as you rank up and then if you die for any reason i think the game demotes you a rank uh which is frustrating because it takes a while to rank up even at the first level like you have to collect five tapes and even if there's like a tape in each room which at level one often there is uh that still takes you know like a minute or two to get back to playing at level two and if you're level two it takes even longer because you still have to get five tapes but now you've got to like they're much more rare and so now it takes like 10 minutes to to rank up oh i don't know if i was good at the game maybe it would take less but it takes me you know 10 20 minutes to rank up from level two to level three and level three you only have to get four tapes but they're super rare and so it's just it's really irritating to to be playing the game and like making progress and then something bad happens and like okay Something bad happens, you know, it's hard, um, but then it, it deranks you and it's like, okay, well, not only do you start over on that level, but you start over on the previous level. Yeah, I see how that would be annoying. You've got something in he, in the show notes about a crash. Yeah, okay, so, so it feels bad to get demoted. Um, so you could just save the game, right? You just save and then you could reload if something bad happens. Ah, but when you quit the game, the, there's no way to save. You can't just tell it to save the game. Uh, the only way to save is when you quit. And so when you quit the game, it automatically deranks you as if you had died. 
So oh. you can't even you can't even leave off where you were. Like if you're two thirds of the way through a run and you're like, oh, it's you know time for bed or something. Not only do you have to start that level all the way over, you start over at the previous level as if you had died. That is super dickish. That sucks. Oh, I, I, I'm done playing the game for now. But the, it's going know, to punish right? me for not playing it. What the right. hell, designer? That's obnoxious. Yeah, it's it's not great. Um, so. To, to combat that, I was like, oh, well, I'll just never quit the game. Like, I've got a computer dedicated to gaming. I'll just leave it running. And I can put it in sleep mode. It keeps running when, you know, the computer comes back out of sleep and the game's still running. Fine. You know, the game doesn't notice. I don't get deranked. It's great. So I was playing through and uh, my first, uh, the first time I was playing and I, I, you know, playing for a while and shut the game off and, or not shut it off, but shut the computer and put it in sleep and brought it back out and played some more. I played for about six hours. And then uh, the game just disappeared. Like it, it just it didn't crash. It just I mean I guess it crashed. It just went away. Like the game shut down. It was gone. I'm like oh that's that's very odd. <laughs> like it's not supposed to do that. So so I was thinking like oh, okay like it must be like auto saving my progress or something. I maybe I'll have to start over at that level. But then I was like oh wait like if I if I just Alt F four out of the game that's a way to close the game. And maintain my progress so probably it's going to demote me back to the previous level i don't know i don't know how this works like interesting so i boot the game back up and uh not only did i have to start over all the way back i think at rank one um but it did not save any of the tapes i had picked up any of the unlocks that i'd gotten anything there was no <gasps> progress saved at all that's unforgivable so, so that it just, is you know, six hours of playtime just disappeared. And yeah, that was, I mean, I was done playing for the day at that point. I was like, oh, uh, I guess I don't want to play this game anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't respect my, my achievements in the game. It doesn't respect when I need to leave. And it doesn't even take the, the courtesy of doing autosaves when I get pickups. Like, it wouldn't be hard at all. Like, I can, I can understand not not wanting to save the whole state of the game world and it's like got a procedurally generated chain of things and there's bullet holes that are, that are persistent and stuff and like that's a lot of data and maybe you don't want to save that all the time like i understand okay fine but at least save the tapes like it's not hard it's probably in a, a array somewhere or like a boolean list like how hard is it to say this guy's unlocked this tape and just save it to disk when that happens like not hard. It's not hard at all. That's how hard. That is terrible. So it crashed. And yeah, so it crashed. So I game lost punishes six you. hours of game. Yeah. So it punishes you for exiting the game. So if you try to fix that by leaving it running for a long time, then it'll punish you even worse by never saving anything. And then you will lose everything. That is a huge pain in the ass. So are these crashes rare? Did you have any more? Uh, well, I had I had one more. Uh, so after it crashed, I was like, okay, well, like clearly I'm just gonna have to unlock everything again. And so I, you know, played some more, and I didn't save because you can't save, and I didn't exit the game because why would I want to get demoted? And uh, I got up to, I was on level three out of five, so there's five ranks. I was at rank three, and I was uh, at three tapes. And when you get close to a tape, there's this kind of operatic music that, that goes that starts playing, so you can tell you're close to one. And so anyway, I had three tapes out of four, and I could hear the music for the fourth tape. It was just around the corner, and the game freezes. And it didn't disappear, so I was like, okay, maybe it's just hitched for a little bit maybe if i just leave it alone but no this was a crash it was done and uh and that was that was it for that eight hours of play tapes discs guns all the unlocks all gone again oh so uh every six to eight hours apparently it crashes now i was watching a streamer and he had two crashes in the period of about an hour and a half i think and so uh not famously stable is what i would say about receiver two Wow. 
that's a huge deal breaker for me. I would I would just melt down so hard if that happened. Like I'd be at risk for bashing up my equipment. There's just no <laughs> way I could I I just that would make me infuriated beyond belief. Punishes you either way. That is unforgivable asshole design. I I yeah, liked I, the first I one, but I, I didn't not, like it either. I'm not getting yeah, I'm not getting near the second one. That is absolutely terrible. So the the upside, if you want to call it an upside, is that there are cheat codes that are very easy to enter to rank up to the next level. So you can manually bypass the demotion on death and the demotion on save by just typing in the cheat code and ranking up. And so if I continue playing, which I haven't after that second crash, but if I do, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to, you know, play the game for a while and then quit so that it saves all my stuff and come back in and then rank up using the cheat code and uh, and play it that way. And it seems like that gets me back to a place where it makes sense to, you know, it makes sense within the context of the game where, you know, I can save my progress, especially if it's unstable. Like, if it was super stable, rock set, solid, like, okay, maybe I just leave it running, but uh, I, I'm just... Yeah, that's not a wager that I'm willing to, to bargain with, especially when it wipes out everything. That is, yeah, a perfect storm of bad decisions and unstable game. That's terrible. So, yeah. not uh, I'm not particularly impressed with that, that uh, pathological avenue that I found myself in. However, uh, like I said, moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is, is really great. The uh, well, okay, so there's another, um, okay, good things. Guns feel great. I mean, Gunplay is great. Firing the gun, there's a, a, a bit of a blank screen as if you're blinking. Uh, it it's feels like uh, like firing. I don't know if you've fired a handgun at a range before or something. Not at a range. <laughs> okay. Well, I did read your autobiography, so I, I know it's something about something, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've fired several weapons at various things in the woods nothing living so i've been target shooting a friend of mine uh, was really into guns and he had a really bad breakup it was really brutal and mm -hmm. so he we went out in the woods and took the teddy bear that she bought him while they were dating and shot it and that was his way of dealing with the pain to shreds you say yes Oh uh, yeah, there was, it was, it was very, we started off with weaker weapons and worked our way up to the shotgun, which pretty much <laughs> completely unmade the bear into this giant, into this giant cloud of fluff floating around in the woods. Oh boy. It made me uncomfortable to shoot an adorable bear, but it made him feel better, so I was willing to go along with it. Yeah, at least he wasn't like giving you his guns temporarily so he wouldn't do something foolish. No, no, he was actually a pretty stable guy. He just, he was the kind of guy that doesn't know how to handle, like, he would not cry in front of people. He doesn't have, like, an outlet for, I mean, I'm mm. talking about him. This yeah, was 30 years outlet, ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't, he, he's not real in touch with his emotions, so he didn't know how to, like, step through that pain or even admit that it was pain and so he was trying to laugh it off at the same time he was trying to deal with it anyway mm. this is a weird digression but it's yeah gotten, it's gotten really serious here um well so when you shoot a gun it's it's shocking uh at least for me it has been and yeah, uh, it I hurt that same feeling. It yeah. freaking hurts yeah. if you don't have uh, ear protection. Even with ear protection on, it's still... Well, even with ear protection, it's still like slap in the face. Uh, especially right. with larger it, calibers. When the pressure wave hits your eyeballs, it it like... <laughs> you know, it, you <laughs> right. can feel it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I felt that same kind of feeling playing the game. Like the, the guns are loud and frightening. And uh, there's a, a blink kind of thing, and there's a recoil, and uh, it takes a second to recover from it, and it's like it's it's good. Um, the uh, the mechanics are very interesting. I like uh, you know mechanical engineering kind of guy, and so I like you know pulling things apart and seeing the insides of them and and caring 
and knowing that the game cares about what's going on inside the weapon. It's like, that's cool. That's, I like it. Um, I don't really like the, the movement. The movement feels kind of sloppy. I don't think there's any air steer, which we've talked about this a little before, but uh, to reiterate, like I feel like air steer is a way for the player to communicate better to the game where it is they're trying to land. It's not so much that it's simulating like in real life you really can air steer because you can't, but it feels like a way to communicate to the game to, to fine tune where you are intending to jump. Because in real life, like you don't just get up on a ledge and just like jump face first into a pillar. Like, you know, if you want right. to do a little hop down, you can do that. And in the game, if it doesn't let you do that, then it there should be some air steer so that you can correct for what it is you're really trying to do. Right. In real life, I can do a small hop. You know, just a couple feet. In, in video games, it's always, you tap that space bar, and it's always a max height jump. It's either give me air steer or the even less realistic, where the longer you hold the jump button, the higher you go, Mario style. So choosing right. between the two, yeah, air steer is probably the best feeling and least ridiculous way of solving the lack of granularity in uh, jumping mechanics, especially in a first person game. Yeah. My goodness, because jumping is complicated, really complicated, and the controls for doing it are simple. And games often, you want to jump exactly there. I don't want to go face first into the wall or leap into the empty space in front of me. <laughs> I want to go right. over there. Yeah. And it's and it's a jump that you can see I'd be able to make in real life. It's just I can't communicate yeah. my intended parabola to the game. So yeah, air steer is a good thing. So there is some accommodation for the fact that there isn't air steer. There are barriers where you might jump up on something and overshoot uh, in some places. But a lot of places, just like if I want to get up on this ledge, I got to be real careful because I might just jump right over it. Uh, and another thing is it has a, a mantling system where you can jump up on things that are too high for you, but if you keep pressing spacebar repeatedly, or, or in this case, I think it's V or something is for jump, I forget, but uh, anyway, for, if you jump... Yeah, it's weird. It, it has some weird... Or, or maybe... No, no. Maybe spacebar is jump, and then, like, instead of control for crouch, it's C for crouch, I think. Anyway. Uh. So, it, it, you can jump, and then if you press jump repeatedly, you can jump up onto something. But you have to be really careful because you have to also be pressing forward to jump up on the thing. And if you're trying to get up onto a wall and you press spacebar too many times or, or too close to when you are completing it, you'll just jump right off the wall and into space. <laughs> and it's like, I, oh. I never have that problem, as it turns out. Like, I never climb up on a wall and then just jump off. <laughs> Accidentally fling yourself into space. Accidentally. Yeah, exactly. And I died several times that way. And... And the first time, the game's like, you died by falling off a high place, demoted. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. Like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Like, But I did it intentionally. The second and third and fourth times that I accidentally jumped off because the controls wouldn't let me do what I wanted, that felt bad. Uh, uh, and yeah. then got demoted for it. So anyway, uh, the jumping system, the mantling system isn't great. doesn't have air steer. Feels a little sloppy. Uh, there's no way to peek, which would be really, really nice, especially in a game where, like, turrets, when they see you, try to shoot you and kill you, and you can, like, stand behind a concrete pillar. And if you want to peek out, you have to shuffle your whole body out to the right, and then as if you're doing some sort of line dance, shuffle your whole body back behind the pillar. Um, so that's oh, not fun. That's really weird to leave out of a game that's going to simulate every part of a gun. And no air steer for you, but like in real life, I can peek around corners. Come on. Yeah, it's. And then we know. already have established mechanics for that E and Q. You press E and you'll lean right, and you press Q and you'll lean left. It's intuitive. Most people have run into it. Some games have it, some games don't. And it's right. natural. Or, or in it's this a... case, you press E and you'll eject your mags from your, your gun. And you press Q, and I forget what happens. You pull out your flashlight or something. Oh, I see. That's that's why they, the controls for the gun take up all the other keys on the keyboard. All of them. Yes. The entire keyboard. Yeah. And they ran out of lean buttons. 
Yeah, it's like uh, it's like the Blender shortcut list. It's just it goes on and on. It's like the whole keyboard is filled up with alt keys and everything. So, so there's there's some good thing. I mean, the guns are the good part of the game, and that's what you come to the game for. If you're coming for anything else, don't don't come. Except the resolution updates. I was just blown away. I don't know if I haven't played like modern good games recently or something, but like. This seems like the only game I've ever played where I can just change the resolution and it just happens. And uh, it was lightning fast. I was just like, did it? It did. It changed just as I, I clicked the button and it was like, bam. The res I didn't have to. I didn't have to wait ten seconds. I didn't have to right. wait for it to pop up a box to say like, did you like your resolution change? Like it was way faster than Windows. I didn't have to restart the game. I didn't have to restart my computer. Nothing. It just. It just happened. It was amazing. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, I kind of know why. A lot of times in games, to change... Oh, you, you want to change your resolution. Well, that means you'll need more video memory. You're bumping up the resolution. You're going to need more video memory. Well, to clear that up, I'm going to have to dump some textures. So you know what? Let me just throw away all texture data. And the frame buffer. I'm gonna th and and all the buffers that go with it because they all have to be changed. And I'll just reallocate everything. And that's the longest part of the loading screen. Oh, and, okay. And I was never sure. I was never close enough to the metal to have to worry about that because some of that is over on the driver layer, and some of it is on whoever made that game engine. And I was always operating above that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the. I always suspected there was a better way to do that, where you could, or at least when I make the frame buffer small, when I drop the resolution, why are you throwing away texture data? You now have more room <laughs> right. for texture data. Yeah, why? Yeah. Why would it be slow to make it? But you know, at, from the dawn of graphics acceleration until the last few years, it was always. Changing resolution was just brutal. I remember the worst was like Unreal Tournament, which that even, I think that even ran in software mode and it was slow both ways. Like huge, like 20, 30 seconds. Like longer than it takes to just launch a level to change the resolution. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah so, I don't know what's, what's so hard about it, but... Well, I mean, I do now. I know what's so hard about it, but man, they figured out something because Receiver Two is just—it's like it's no problem at all. It's amazing. Yeah. I seem to remember a project I did once, where I forget what was I doing that I wanted to change the resolution often, and so at the start when the program launched, it looked at whatever your desktop resolution was and allocated enough memory for that. Uh -huh. Even if even if the window I was it was a windowed program, but it would just when it launched it would just full desktop amount of memory, and that let me resize the window without too much of a hitch. But I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, maybe that's like, what they're doing. I don't know, but it it I does know I, what your desktop resolution is because you can select it. It's right at the top of the menu, but it doesn't default to that. It defaults to a window that's smaller than that. But then the other thing is it switched to, to borderless window mode just super fast, too. And it seems like other games struggle with that as well. So it's, I don't know, whatever they're doing with their, their render pipeline, and it's super versatile and really quick to respond. So that part of the game is not about the guns and also is really good. Cool. Well, that's admirable. I'm still not buying the game, but that's admirable. <laughs> uh, so what game are you playing, then? <laughs> yeah, I intended to buy this this week. But I am deep in the clutches of City Skylines. And I sort of like, every time I think I'm done with the game, I think of a new thing to do. Like, oh, I'm going to get one of those mods that will let me unlock. Okay, in, in the original game, you played on a 3x3 three three grid. Okay, three regions, you know. So you'd have nine total tiles. Right, and on. you could unlock them. You'd start with right. just one, right? And then you'd unlock them to buy them or whatever right. to expand. But there was a lot of map outside of that area. But at launch, they were like, the, the team was like, okay, you could 
make a mod to unlock the rest of the map. But we're not going to support that because it's just too much horsepower to run a city that oh, size. Sure, sure. And you start running into weird limits. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But it, I, I was sitting here thinking, wait, my computer can handle that now. Here's one that you know gives you one more block in every direction for a five by five grid. So that's that's quite that's quite a jump from yeah it's almost it's like two and a half times larger right right oh but wait there's another one that can do seven by seven how big are these <laughs> no. oh oh no wait the the best one is nine by nine for 81 tiles that lets you play all the way up to the edge of the map and this is very obviously not intended because right you can see the edge of the world <laughs> you can scroll right up and watch it, it in the original, in at launch, you know, there was like this blue fog. It would just sort of fade into the skybox, right? Right, yeah. So, so you could never see the edge of the world. Now you can go right up to it and watch cars vanish into oblivion. But now the map is honking huge. The previous limit was nine. And, and now the, the limit is 81 squares. It's literally nine times larger. Right. And I played a map on that and tried to fill it up. Um, and that was fun. I eventually hit internal limits of the engine. Apparently, you can only have, brace yourself, 16,000 vehicles oh. at once. And so I hit that limit. I And I didn't even realize, I didn't even know this was a thing. I was just instant crime wave across my city and I was like what's going on look at this place it has terrible crime and it's next to a police station where are the police cars and I was trying to figure out what's going on and I finally looked it up and I found out oh you hit the 16k limit it won't spawn more cars now you just they can't it was like oh nope too many won't spawn it and so eventually as your city service vehicles you know like the police car will go back into its station and vanish from the world and then instantly you know there's a hundred thousand citizens waiting to leave their driveway boom one of them takes that slot so over time your city services get pushed out and no city services. Eventually, you won't get any fire trucks. Eventually, it'll just be all cars and trucks. Right? Right. And, and then I got all fires and crimes. And then the people start leaving. And then your services can come back. So it's a self-correcting right. problem, right? Right. Well, there, there was a mod that just reserves the last, I think, 50 slots for city services. And that fixed it for oh, me. Okay. It doesn't even take that much. Neat. So that was cool. But I made and then the probably possible. as your city gets yeah. bigger, the traffic problems get lighter because there are less cars per surface area, right? You'd think so, but then I built a building that like quadrupled the the tourism value of my city, and it was just no. instant gridlock. Like it was a wonderful city, and I could stop that from happening at any time by deleting that building. But I'm just not worth, I'm just not willing to do that. And I can't bear to play a, a map with traffic that horrendous. So I just, I just stopped. I saved it and I'm imagining it in that, okay, it's done. And I'll never fire it up again. And those people will, won't be trapped in a world of hellish traffic forever. <laughs> wow. That sounds pretty but cool. That, so how close did you get to filling up the map? Um... Not that close. It was uh, I quite big, way bigger, you know, than anything I've built before by, you know, a huge margin. Um, but it it wasn't filling. Oh, you know, there's a lot of there was mountains in the background, and I didn't like try and put a city on a mountain. And there's a bunch of ocean, and I, you know, didn't put city in the ocean. I didn't like fill in it, fill in the ocean, you know. And so, I don't know. It felt like maybe I got half the surface area covered with city, which is still being like four times bigger than you could before. Something like that. Right. Right. And okay, that's that's fine. And I was like backed away from the game, and I'm like, now I'm done. 
And then I started thinking about how cities grow. So, here's a little tangent. In all of these sim games, you know, they're all ba have you you've played Sim City, right? Oh yeah. I I didn't ever play the original Sim City or I played it at a friend's house. I never owned it. But uh Sim City 2000 was right. uh just a hit at my house. Yeah, that was that was the high water mark for the series until Skylines came along. <laughs> for the <laughs> until genre someone else did it. Yeah, yeah. Right. But the the growth in those games is kind of funny. You have you start out with huge residential demand. So you got to build a bunch of houses. And then those people suddenly need a place to shop. And then once you build the shopping, then the shopping places need an industry to give them stuff. And of course that's completely backwards from how towns actually grow. Right. Right. For gameplay yeah, yeah. purposes. People yeah, move for there because there's industry and then right. because the industry is there, people build shops to support the industry and then people build houses because they got to live there. It's like, yeah, it's exactly right. backward. Right. And you don't get the big shops. Like, you don't get a strip mall until, you know, population hits a certain level. Like, nobody cares. You know, you'll get, you'll get simple stores until things get really big. So, right. I, I decided I wanted to build organically. Like, okay, I, 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 and I, I'm not really criticizing the genre. That's the most interesting way for a player to engage with it, especially a first time player. You want to build some houses. Oh, look, now I have people in my city moving around, and it's a little ant farm to play with. And then to expand into the other things. It feels very abstract if you start with industry and you're making huge long-term decisions for your city. But, right. But, you know, I've been through this game enough times that I was like, that might be interesting. So I had to enable all kinds of cheats to make this work. <laughs> to get over the... To, I mean, you, you the game is nuts. That you don't get enough money at the start of the game to, like launch an industry, right? You have just enough to build some roads for a handful of houses. And then you have to soak up tax revenue from these people that evidently, evidently buy no goods and have no jobs, but somehow they still have income that you can tax. <laughs> right. Maybe they're all YouTube streamers. Um, it's the future. So... I built one by building an industry first, and then, okay, this industry hires people, those people need a place to live. They'll start off with really small, cheap homes, just throwing them up like your typical industry town. Just rows and rows of packed houses. And then, once you get some money flowing, you know, some more breathing room for the houses. And then, once your population gets above a certain level, then strip malls. And I did this in two different spots on the map. So you've got, essentially, two small towns expanding outward. And I just sort of like do what makes sense instead of what will make the biggest city, which is how people normally play this game. And what I wound up with was something that looked a lot like real life. Like you kind of see um, why America looks the way it does, especially the area around here where we have a lot of industry. Like... Hey, how come you guys don't use roundabouts? And it's like, well, we kind of grow real fast because there's lots of open space. And then by the time the traffic gets bad enough, there's no room unless you're going to destroy a bunch. Of, I, right. I limited my... All the corner my, stores, all the historic corner stores and just bulldoze them. No, that's right. not how we do things. That's not how we do things. And I sort of put that restriction on myself. Let's pretend that you can't just casually bulldoze entire neighborhoods for your convenience or on a whim. And that that also, the, mo the more I played under these restrictions, the more like the area around me looks. Monolithic industry, people that work there, and then... And then um, commercial property to sell to them, and then more people to support that infrastructure. And I ended up with islands of like medium-sized towns, no big skyscrapers, and there'd be a highway between them. 
you know, and that's what right. it's like here. Oh, I want to visit the next town. I will get on a highway and travel over mostly empty land. And so instead of this death ball city that just nucleates and becomes Manhattan, you end up with a bunch of small towns that, that expand towards each other very gradually. And I couldn't stop playing. I was just fascinated by how much this construction looked so much more real than the traditional gameplay. Like, oh, these are the systems that drive city growth. At least, I mean, all of this obviously applies, like, to where I live. It's very different for Europeans who live in cities that are thousands of years old. And, you know, don't even know why the city was begun thousands of years ago. Sure. Although most of them are on rivers and, you know, it's where right. people could live. So it's like, it happened. It just happened a long, long time ago. And it's been going on for so long that, like you said, it's been lost a lot of the time. Right. And, and that, you know, making roundabouts was often a matter of, hey, there's this big empty space. It used to be mud. And then we paved it. And then we turned it into, like, because the spacing is really weird over there. Because, Nobody was planning for cars when they were building things in 1200 AD. Right. So it would be interesting if I understood Europe better. Like we said last week, I've never been there. It would be interesting to see if I could devise a system of rules that would emergently create a very European-styled city. I would love to mm, hear from European... Right. From, yeah, I would love to hear from... Your, like, would you sort of build a town of tightly packed town made for pedestrians and then try with ter tearing down as few buildings as possible try and turn that into a drivable town that's or, probably wrong or like do you build a roman city first and then like build a bunch of like you said pedestrian walks around that so then you get like the little grid in the middle and then right. you, like bulldoze a bunch of stuff to make wider avenues and then like fill them all back in when times got bad and then like you know like how many iterations do you need before it looks right 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 oh yeah and there's the whole thing where you got to build a bunch of farmland let it sit there for a while and then every time you need space you have to you have to tear down a farm and replace it with streets so as you get further from the city center, you'll have it be more planned and less organic. I don't know. I'd yeah. love to hear from a, Euro from a European, European, how they would plan something. Like, what kind of restrictions would create a city that looks like Euro I know, Europe? Uh, I know Lindy Beige did a video on comparing cities in, I think it was uh, Ecuador, or something, you know, one of the one of the uh, Central South American cities to the European ones, where the ones in Central America were planned from the beginning because they were built by the conquistadors, and so they do have this very solid like grid structure in the middle, and then it gets a bit more organic as it goes outward. Whereas, like you said, in Europe, it's very uh, disorderly and kind of organic in the middle, and then it's more grid like on the on the outskirts where it was growing in the modern era. It's really interesting. Lindy Beige, that's a good channel. Yeah, he's got a lot of good stuff. So, on the show notes, here is Combat and Construction. Compare and Contrast. Uh, this must be your topic. Tell me about it. Yeah, I, I uh, saw a comment in last week's mailbag, and it sparked something. I, I wrote something on it, but um, I figured we could talk about it here because it's, it's a fascinating thing that happens in a lot of video games that have both combat and construction, where the combat is slowed down and the construction is sped up so that they both happen on about the same time scale. And I was thinking, like, there's a lot of other things, too. Like, the construction is also much easier, and the combat is much harder. Like, there's a lot of things that happen to kind of align those when a game has both. Hmm. So if you think about Minecraft, for example, like, construction in Minecraft is super easy. It's, it's even easier than mining. Which is also right. weird. And then, right. like, that combat is, really is super hard. Like, you could build a whole building in the time it takes to kill a single wolf in Minecraft. And it's like, that's totally not right. 
but it feels right because they are happening about at the same speed and they accomplish about the same thing in the game. What do you mean they accomplish the same thing? Well, so building a house isn't actually as important in Minecraft as it is in real life. Like, it doesn't matter if you get wet, doesn't matter if you get sunburned, uh, doesn't matter if your things get wet, doesn't matter if you can, you know, no monsters are going to come and steal your stuff, you're not going to get rats, you're not going to get, you know, the, the cold from sleeping out in the rain. Like, building a house is just like, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a convenience. It keeps the monsters out, but that's not even as hard as just killing monsters, which also is not a big deal. So it's like, it's one of these weird things where like building a house in Minecraft isn't really a big deal and it's not really important. Just like going and hunting in Minecraft isn't a really big deal, but also isn't really that important compared to in real life. Right. Right. Food and shelter are something that you do for cosmetic reasons in Minecraft. Well, I guess you do kind of need food. That's right, since the update, you need food. Yeah, yeah, it'll start to... But it's not that hard. And I think you need to eat, like, once every three days. <laughs> so it's not super important. Right. You'll, uh, especially you compared need, to the amount of work you're doing. Right, you need to eat once every three days. And that's if you're not sleeping. If you're sleeping, then you can go a week between meals. <laughs> So I don't know if you've noticed that or, or had any other insights on on uh, combat and construction in games together from, I don't know, Fortnite or or games that have... The context that came up in was games that have uh, more of a city building aspect and also have construction because we talked about uh, Titan, uh, cities of Titan or whatever. Europa. Moons, uh, industry of Europa. Indus oh, was. oh y yeah, something of of Titan. Yeah, the moon of Jupiter. Um, yeah. Yeah. That has both combat and construction in it. And um, the first place I encountered that, and something came up in the comment, was Settlers, the, um, the game The Settlers. And its sequels all had those aspects. The construction was more prominent, but there was some combat in it. And it always felt weird to me, because like, by the time that I could march my army across to the enemy place... They could build a whole castle to defend themselves. <laughs> right. And, like, as long as they if, know you're coming. Right. What's the point then? Like, why would I accept to make sure they're paying attention, I guess? Uh, you know, the, a funny example of this is tower defense games, where building is literally instantaneous. Right. Like, and it takes for uh, combat takes forever. Like, oh, I've been I've shot this guy 500 times. He's walking around with 500 arrows in him. I better build <laughs> right. I better instantly build another stonework tower to shoot arrows out of right in front of his path. <laughs> that is like, backwards. Yeah, it's such an inversion, yeah. It makes for a really good I'm as an aside, tower defense seems to have gone by the... That used to be a major staple of casual, like, coffee break games. And they've sort of vanished. Yeah, Mindustry does it a little bit, but uh, even that isn't super tower defense-y and more, uh, more about building infrastructure and stuff. Well, combat and construction. So what other games do both? Other than, yeah, I don't play a lot of them. Like, I don't play Fortnite. I don't play Rust or Daisy. Uh, so, or any of the Minecraft Anno, clone type. Any of that stuff? Yeah. I guess we were no. talking about that in a minute, but. That is interesting. Yeah, I, I don't usually How many play games them you... uh, either. Yeah. Yeah, most games focus on one or the other, and you don't often see them in the same game. That's another funny thing about that. You do Well, StarCraft is kind of the progenitor example, right? Yeah, that's true. That has building that is not instantaneous and it has combat that is, you know, it actually is a big part of the game. When do I construct things because there's a cost to constructing it. That's interesting.
But the, and that's people would say that's a very combat focused game. But the construction is all feeding into the combat. You don't just build things because it's nice. <laughs> Everything you build has incredible purpose. And the yeah. two are very much bound together. Like you balance the combat by adjusting the building times of the buildings. <laughs> You'll see patch notes like, oh, we made hatcheries take 10 seconds longer to build. And it's like, wow, is that really a big deal? And then you watch people playing at the professional level and you realize, oh, wow, that's a huge deal. <laughs> yeah, a half second would be a huge deal. 10 seconds is just like, oh, they just want Zerg to lose now. Right. Also, Protoss, to help balance them out, they will no longer take damage. <laughs> We're hoping they'll win some <laughs> matches now. Actually, actually, I don't know where the metagame is now. I remember for years it was a joke how Toss loses all the time. I have no idea if that's, that was like, you know, eight years ago or whatever. The, the, the metagame has probably evolved now, so who knows who's the big... There's always one race that everybody complains it's too weak. Yeah. And in a game that's focused on, like you said, if it focuses on one and the other, or the other, uh, then it kind of makes you question, like, why do you have the construction in there at all, or, or the combat in there at all, if you have to, like, fudge it so much to get it to fit? Because, like, construction in StarCraft... Okay, it's a super realistic, you know, fan or not super realistic, super fantasy, you know, sci-fi setting or something, and everything's really high tech, and so you can build stuff really quickly. Yeah, maybe, but like, if it's that easy to build, then why are units so hard to build? Like, you could build a whole factory, but then it takes you forever to build a single guy. Like, that doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? <laughs> it takes you just as long. I, I like how you're training these guys, but. I just built the building, and we when I built it, it was just a big empty building. So where are these people coming from? It should be, it should be breed, raise, and train space marine. That's what the button should be. Right. Like where are these people coming from? Yeah. I understand for pro I it, well, you're literally growing them in uh, Zerg. They grow from eggs. You grow them, and sure, in Protoss, yeah, they're, yeah. And in Protoss, they're supposedly being beamed from some from the home world or whatever. But for humans, they just build an empty building that's like a clown car, and just space marines keep popping <laughs> out of it until you go broke. Right. Yeah, yeah. The closer it comes to like real life, the more absurd it becomes. Like, okay, I can imagine, like you know space wizards warping in and like aliens you know breeding like mad or whatever fine but like why did you put humans and marines in there like i i know it's supposedly for empathy but like it just makes the whole thing ridiculous in the old games where everything was more cartoonish your your main base would be like a castle and it might even look a little bit like a town and you would understand okay this is an abstraction this is like a whole town but it's not showing me the inner workings of it so when somebody pops out we can just assume that we took one of the villagers and trained them to be a knight or whatever but yeah in starcraft it's just you and some it's just like eight guys you know in in like i don't even know what you'd call them kind of like forklift mechs <laughs> non-combat right. forklift mechs and one domed building, and from that come hundreds and hundreds of space marines. And you're like, where did these dudes come from? It's funny, and you're obviously not supposed to think about it this much. So tell us in the comments. Yeah. In the so tell us in the comments below, where do space marines come from? Uh you know what? We are low on time, but at the same time, one of these emails dovetails nicely it brings up a game we just talked about so i'm gonna do the first one and i'm gonna save the next two for next week okay have you guys ever played the latest anno game that is some fun plate spinning slash town building it is anno 1800 it isn't on steam anymore 
I'll, because I'll bet you Ubi. Oh yeah, next sentence. But on the Ubi Store or Net Epic, there is some light, boring combat and a story. But the star is the town building and plate spinning. Zerv. Double V, actually. Here's the thing about Anno Game. Thank you for the question, Zerv. Um, here's the thing about the Anno Games, and you kind of touched on it when you mentioned the storefront. Anno Games have always, like, Ubisoft loves their DRM. They love their DRM. And Anno has always been obnoxious, even by even by Ubisoft standards. It's like, I know I sort of lost interest in the, like I looked at one and it was like, it, it needs to phone home every time you launch the game. And that just, that just makes my blood boil. I get so angry. Like, how dare you? Did you, I already signed in the last time I launched this game. Did you think that somehow the game became pirated since then? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Why would you do this to me? And I, it just makes me so angry. Now, I've put up with phone home DRM in some games when I already really love it. You know, a series will... A series... I can't think of, a, of an example, but... You, you know, one of those games where it just needs to talk to the server every time you launch it. And that makes me angry, but I put up with it if I already love the series. But if it's a game that I'm not yet a fan of, I'm like, I'm not putting up with that. I've spent, you know, for the last 15 years, there's always that one game every year where you try to launch it and it's like, hang on, uh, let me get permission from the person you bought this game from to see if you're allowed to use. Oh. I couldn't get permission. It's probably your internet connection because our servers never would go down. So it's your problem. Nothing I can do. You can't play. And that is just, it's impossible for me to describe this situation further without using horrible, horrible language and bringing their families into it. I'm just like so angry. <laughs> At the at the mere suggestion that this is an okay thing to do to your paying customer, like I yeah, don't feel pirate bad. game. Yeah, I don't pirate games, and I won't. So if you punish me for piracy after I've given you sixty dollars, then we're enemies forever. Um, yeah, so and I just Anno won't put up with it. Sixty bucks. Like, yeah. How much does City Skylines cost? I think it's thirty now. Although, to be fair, if you want it and all the DLC, it's like 108 bucks. Yeah. But, but you can get a you know, you can get the base game for 30 and it frequently goes on sale for 15. And uh and yeah, it's I don't know. So I've I've never played an Anno game. I have watched several not let's plays, but like I have I've watched several segments of Let's Plays, and it always felt kind of like a, I don't know, it's like a The Sims version of a city builder or something. The Sims? But wait, you mean the game The Sims. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. I don't, well, it's just, it strikes me as like this weird... It's like building, it's not so much a simulation as it is like a dollhouse, kind of. Okay, I know what you mean there. Yeah, The Sims, the original The Sims, was more simulationist. And every episode, and every iteration since then has become more an emergent storytelling tool where you play with your little people action figures. And yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And it is weird. Yeah, and I don't know. It, it just feels like it doesn't have a lot of underlying depth to the mechanics. It's just like, well, like Zerv says, it's a lot of plate spinning. Like, make sure that your heat levels stay high and your food levels and your entertainment levels. And don't forget about the fishing and don't forget about the that thing. And like, none of it balances itself. And you're supposed to be the one keeping tabs on all these different systems but there's no depth to it it's just like make sure you got enough of this kind of building and this kind of building and this kind of building interesting 
Yeah, that sounds like I could have fun with it, but I I am not going hat in hand to ask Daddy Ubisoft if I can play Anno today. Pretty please, I've been a good boy. Yeah. So I so when I uh, I saw this the question, I was like, oh, I've never played an Anno game. Maybe this is maybe this is time to try. Like maybe I can you know give it a shot, and see how it goes. And so I did. I checked on uh, like he says, it's not available. Uh, it, on GOG. This is the first place I checked. I was like, oh, I'll just go on GOG and like, right. it'll be great. There's no DRM. Especially when a game is old. Uh, Ubisoft doesn't even put their back catalog on GOG. They're like, no, mine, mine. mine use our well, shitty storefront. Uh, the, GOG does have three versions of Anno, the, the oldest oh, three versions. They? So, now I don't know if they also have like, they've got rolled in Ubisoft DRM in them or something. I don't know how right. that works, or if, if you know, there's a deal to put it on GOG, you can't have any DRM, or if it's just that GOG doesn't enforce any DRM. Um, but I didn't, I didn't buy any of them either, because this was about the latest one. I was like, oh, the latest one is really good. Maybe the older ones aren't so great. Um, so I went on Steam. I was like, oh, maybe it's on Steam. It's not on Steam at all. You know, I don't, I don't know if they have any versions of Anno on Steam anymore. Um, and so at that point, I was like, oh, well, like. Where am I supposed to get this? And so I looked it up on Wikipedia, and sure enough, it's an Ubisoft game. And I was like, man, the last Ubisoft game I played was From Dust, I think, which is also the first Ubisoft game I played with the long, unskippable opening thing and the overwrought, badly animated cutscenes that you couldn't skip and the phone home DRM on a single player game. And I was just like, I'm no, I no Ubisoft. You're you're done. I I you don't exist. Right. It is just so bad. It is so bad. Although I'm probably going to swallow my pride, bite the bullet, and get beyond good and evil, which I'm sure they'll make an exclusive on their stupid stupid broken platform, and I'll put up with it, and I'll probably you know, if they ever bother to come out with this game, I think it was supposed to come out last year. And we're still, <laughs> yeah. We don't even have a release was, date yet. They gave us some really nice trailers, but no gameplay right. footage. No, no, no gameplay footage. I don't know where that game is at, but if it ever comes out, you know, maybe 2021, it'll come out and we'll get, you know, a 5,000 word rant on how, ba how bad you play sucks in 2021. Because it's been a while since I've done a good you play rant. All of the the <laughs> rants I have about it are old, and so it'll be nice to come back and see: is it still terrible for all those reasons, or have they come up with new reasons to be new ways to be terrible? Are they innovating in their terribleness, or are they stuck in a creative rut? <laughs> I'm looking forward to to hearing about that. But if if we're going to hear that rant, then they need to come out with Beyond and Good and Evil, too. I don't know what they're doing with that game. I think maybe it got away from them. <laughs> Turning into Beyond Good and Evil, the cinematic experience. Right. Well, I just think their their scope is so... I mean, even in those trailers, the scope was just so ridiculous. Massive, open world, multiple characters that you can switch between... It's like Grand Theft Auto V, except they were like, that's too small scale for us. And we want more gameplay modes. <laughs> yeah, and now it's got pigs in space! <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, I miss the original Muppet Show so much. That was so good. Well, I feel like we've done a show, Paul. The feeling has returned. All right, everybody, you know how numbers work. Next week is diecast number 300. Now, so what I want to do for 300 is just do wall-to-wall -wall mailbags. So if you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Please send them in before next Saturday, and we will try to answer as many of them as we can. Which so far is two, so we're going we're gonna to make it, I think. Right. Well, we'll answer these two. Uh, apparently, episode 300 will be very short. We'll answer these two questions. 
and then we'll be done. That's good. More time to play City like Skylines it. for me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and more times to type in cheat codes for Receiver 2. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>